Hallo, hier ist Michael Adams für Stock Telegraph und ich habe im Januar, als ich in Vancouver war, eine sehr interessante, ein sehr interessantes Intro zu einer Company bekommen und zwar durch einen Broker, den ich dort kenne. Und er hat gesagt, ähm, geh doch mal bei Jericho Oil vorbei und äh, da war ich dann auch. Ähm, allerdings war der Alan Wilson, der ist äh, President und CEO, war leider äh, irgendwie verhindert oder er war jedenfalls nicht im Büro und ich hatte auch einen sehr engen äh, äh, Terminplan, genau, ich habe das Wort vergessen, einen sehr engen Terminplan, deswegen hat das nicht mehr geklappt, aber seitdem habe ich die Company ein bisschen verfolgt, sie hatte einen sehr guten Run bisher schon, ähm, seit Anfang des Jahres und ähm, ja, Jericho Oil ähm, ist auf, an, der, an der TSX Venture notiert, das Symbol ist JCO, aber auch in Deutschland, die WKM ist die A116HR und das deutsche oder Frankfurter Symbol ist JLM und äh, wie immer oder wie sehr oft habe ich ja den Joe Brunner dabei, ja, den den österreichischen Ölexperten, den kennen Sie sicherlich auch schon und lesen auch seinen Small Cap Investor. Ja, wenn nicht, dann auf jeden Fall sich die Webseite anschauen und kostenlos abonnieren. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Um, in my introduction, and also Joe in his introduction, yeah, we were referring to um, how we got or I got aware of the um, on the company, and that was in January. And since then, it's it was on my watch list, and you already had a really really good run, yeah, stock price wise. Um, and that's in a in a pretty tough market for the oil exploration companies, right? A lot of them are really, really struggling. And so as Joe and myself, we are really interested to what is the difference? What's your equity story? And why are you not suffering as much as the others do? Well, first, let me say thanks for having me. And uh, that's a good question because it was an extremely difficult year for equity, oil equity stocks last year, uh, particularly the juniors. Um, I think one aspect to our story is that we really entered the oil space in 2014. So 2014 uh, was our first acquisition. Uh, and actually, as the prices oil or the commodity has dropped, I actually think it's a tremendous opportunity uh, to build an oil company. Uh, because we start out with a fresh balance sheet, uh, no debt, uh, and the ability to raise a little bit of money, it's put us in a strong position to buy assets. Our story is, is really simple. When we started in 2014, oil was, you know, in the high 90s, 9500 oil. And my team and myself, you know, we worked very hard looking for projects and we found tremendously difficult to, to model projects that were going to get us to profitability. Uh, we thought we were being conservative because we were using a 70 or $75 price. Um, I will be the first to admit I did not see $28 coming, but we looked to projects that would make money in a tough environment. And our first set of assets was in Kansas. And I won't spend too much time talking about that because that's really 2014. And I think 2015 is really the story of the oil market, but it's important to understand our beginnings. And we picked Kansas because at the time in 2014, all the uh, publicity, even on the Wall Street Journal, you would hear about fracking, deep horizontal wells. You'd hear about North Dakota, South Saskatchewan, Alberta, And they were prolific, but the numbers, when we looked at them, they didn't really seem to make sense. And on the other side of it was, you know, we were a small company. Our initial raise was six and a half million dollars. And truly in the oil business, six and a half million dollars is, is actually not a lot of money. That may, may not even be one horizontal well. So we said, let's, let's stay within ourselves. Let's do a, uh, enter somewhere where we think that we can make money and get the company to profitability. And so what we did was we said, okay, everyone is moving to North Dakota, South Saskatchewan. Where is the capital leaving? What market is not being, is being attended to? And we looked at Kansas, Oklahoma, the mid continent, which are traditionally have always produced a lot of oil and they're a little bit, the reservoirs there are more understood. So slightly lower risk, you know, in the oil industry, Uh, you can never say something is no risk um, with any resource, but because oil has been produced there since the early 1900s, it's very understandable and very predictable. So in 2014, but, but what I would say is it's, it's for a public company, it is not a very sexy story, if you will. You know, these, these wells in Kansas produce one, two, three barrels a day, but 
while you're drilling these wells, if something goes wrong, you can move on very quickly. You know, a completed well would cost us $50,000, and if it was a dry hole by five or $6,000, we, we could move on. So there was never any well that was gonna be a critical mistake to us. Okay. So 2014, we drilled with our partner about 175 wells. We started in April. By September, we had our first profitable month uh, company-wide. And today, those wells still make money at the wellhead every day, but they're not company makers. And what I was planning to do if oil had stayed where in the higher prices was to use Kansas as platform number one. And then when we had stable cash flow, do platform number two. And platform number two, if you refer to our presentation, and I'll skip through the forward-looking statement, because as I said, oil is a risk, like any commodity, is a risky business. And I, I encourage your viewers to have a look at the statement. But we decided to look at um, the mid-continent, specifically Oklahoma, as our second platform. The reason for Oklahoma is it's been a top 10 producing oil state. Um, it is oil friendly. It, it, there are a lot of uh, the government, the regulations are very friendly and there's a lot of access to workers and services. And when starting the company, I had a mandate. What I always, I wanted to, you know, my background is junior companies. I've been in the junior capital market since the early 90s and always loved oil because of the cash flow nature of the business. It's a wonderful business because you can sell your product every day. But as I said, with starting with just $6 million, as much as there's oil in Nigeria, Venezuela, Africa, offshore, my mandate was I have to be able to get in my car and drive to it. And I won't get in my car and drive to, to Oklahoma, but that gives you this sort of scope of where I want it to be. And we did think about Alberta and Saskatchewan at the time, right. but a small company needs to be focused. You know, I would, I would warn anyone that when you meet a small company that's got operations in Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, I wonder how you can service all those things. So as we started to look at projects in Oklahoma, um, we remained focused there and that is where our focus is today. Okay. So Kansas was 2014, we moved into 2015, the price of the commodity had just started to drop. We had raised a little bit more money and we started aggressively looking in Oklahoma. Uh, in 2015, we made three notable acquisitions in Oklahoma. Um, these are the acquisitions if you refer to the slide. Uh, the first acquisition was from a major company called Chaparral Energy. Um, Chaparral at the time was a 30,000 barrel a day company and they had this project which for their, from their standpoint, from a drilling perspective, was not successful. Then. They had invested over $40 million into it and it was only yielding about 60 barrels a day. So at a, a 30,000 barrel company, 60 barrels doesn't matter very much. So we purchased it, but what they had invested in 40 million, we purchased for one and a half with our partner. You know, we quickly turned that into 80, 90 barrels a day, and that project has been profitable since the day we got it last May. Okay. When we purchased that project, we learned two things. And the two things, important things we learned was the formation that we were in. And I'm not gonna get overly technical for your, your viewers. I have to, you know, I, I, I can if anyone wants to reach out to us, but the formation was called the Mississippi Line. And as much as everyone has heard about the Bakken, the Eagle for the Permium, all these basins that were drilled horizontally successfully, there's been many basins that were drilled unsuccessfully. And the Mississippian would be an example of it. However, it has been drilled conventionally um, successfully since the early 1900s. And where the Mississippian sits, you've got probably six layers above it. And those zones above it, stacked pays, are really what companies are looking for nowadays because it gives you optionality. So our view as a company was, okay, we'll buy, the, we'll buy these. So for all the Mississippian limes that failed, you know, one in every three or one in every four would work. And those wells are really good wells. So what we've been doing over 2015 was purchasing the wells that work. And what that has allowed us to do is we can purchase, we, are, we believe it is cheaper right now to purchase production than drill for it. So what we're doing is we're buying production. Our mandate is that it has to be cash flow positive within three months of acquisition. That hopefully the production would hold the acreage. So ideally we get as much acreage as we can to that can be held by production. And the advantage to that is that we want to build up a land bank of drilling targets. 
because ultimately, I personally believe and our company believes that the long-term price of oil is higher than $40. I'm not saying this year, I'm not even saying next year. I'm saying at some point, I think oil normalizes around $60 a barrel. When it's $60 a barrel, it's gonna become difficult to buy, just like it was in 2014. Right. So I think the opportunity to build that land bank up right now is a unique and, and once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, so, and I really, I really, sorry, I really like this strategy and it kind of reminds me a little bit, and maybe Joe, um, it reminds me a little bit of what uh, First Mining is doing. Yeah, not in the oil and gas sector, but um, in the mining sector where they're uh, at, at low valuations, they are buying um, companies and assets from distressed companies, yeah, and, and just put them away. Yeah, for a better market. And Joe, maybe because you also have some opinion on the oil price, and if you want to check my crystal ball, yeah, which is here. Um, so what, what, what do you think about the oil price? Just um, you, I know you're very bullish on oil. So what, what's your timeline on oil going back to above a hundred bucks? You ask me. Yeah, I ask you. <laughs> no, I, I think we have. Uh, uh, a chance, not big. Uh, uh, in the long term, I must say that in the long term, I believe that we're going up to 70, 80 bucks, around maybe 90 bucks. Um, but uh, uh, we have really a, a, a chance that we saw uh, or will see in the second half of 2006 or the first half of 2017 one spike up to 100 bucks. The reason is simple uh, drilling uh, going dramatically down. You see it on the uh, Uh, newest numbers of um, the uh, U.S. Energy um, Information Department uh, that the, the production going down. If OPEC uh, make a decision in June that they maybe uh, freeze uh, the production or um, they uh, cut the production down, um, then uh, you see that the surplus or the, the this um, uh, supply demand. Um, will change dramatically that we get under production in the second half of, of, of uh, 2016. And I don't see too much more oil coming on the market than uh, not too much money flow, flows into the market. Um, we need much, much more investment that we can um, fill up then or we can you know, bring the, the, the decline rate, uh, rate up to a normal level. And um, uh, that's, I think we have really a, a chance, a small chance that uh, we be going up to 200 bucks uh, back in the next uh, 12 months. Then I think we're coming down then to 60, well, Joe, 70 or so. Sorry to interrupt, Joe, but I think you make a really good point because w what people maybe don't realize is that there's one characteristic that oil comp all oil companies have is that as you produce, you're depleting your assets. So if you're not reinvesting and creating more reserves, you, you're, you, every year you're going to have less and less. And all you need to do is turn on CNBC in America, Business News Network in Canada, or the equivalent in, in Europe, and you'll see that companies are slashing their reinvestment programs. <coughs> and what this is going to create is at some point in the future, I believe, as much as I'm driving Jericho to be profitable, so we want to have cash flow, eventually we'll take our cash, reinvest it, and if we get big enough, hopefully we have enough cash flow to pay a dividend. But what I think is really going to happen in the market is bigger companies are going to need to add to their reserves because their production, they need to continue to grow it. Otherwise, they're going to be punished in the market. And this is going to lead to a huge wave of mergers and acquisitions because the only way to increase your reserves and increase your production will to be by other smaller companies. And I would like to become the consolidator of land that I have the kind of production that a company may want. We, you know, we started with 25 barrels a day, which is nothing. We're now at 250, and I think we'll be 1,000 barrels a day soon. 1,000 seems to be the magic number. And, you know, my goal, as much as that's my short-term goal, my goal is to get, you know, bigger up to, more, you know, 2,500 than 5,000 barrels a day. And it's not just the barrels of production, but it's also the land that you buy. I have an advantage when I go and buy land or production from another company because There's no surprise. There's a ton of distress out there. There's very, very highly leveraged companies out there that are really struggling. And although oil's moved up here in the last you know, month or so, it's, it's really too little too late. But when I go in to buy a project, I walk in there and excuse us, but I say, listen, I'm not a petroleum engineer. I'm just a dumb finance guy. 
I want to know how much you produce and what does it cost. I don't, and I, 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 and they'll tell me, but we have all this potential. We have all these reserves that will become economical at a higher price. And I simply tell them that no, I don't care about that. Now that's not true. What I, what I believe for my company is those reserves and those upsides are for my shareholders. So if I'm, I will purchase at the proven developed producing price, maybe a little bit of a discount there, but as the price recovers, you know, all those things become economical and become valuable to our shareholders. Okay. And it's a unique position. The key to being able to do it though, is being able to raise money. And before we, you know, I'll point out that Jericho so far, we've raised about $18 million. We've paid no, virtually no finders fees. We've engaged no bankers. We've been able to do it through my network of investors. And that has given us a leg up on other junior companies. You know, we've been able to find the majority of our investors are U.S. family offices. Um, our largest shareholder is a, is a famous name. So if you just go look at and see who the 17% shareholder is, which is, is filed on CDAR, that it's the Breen family. And, and, and the patriarch of that family is Ed Breen, who is the CEO of DuPont. So he's busy right now merging DuPont and Dow Chemical. But this is someone who understands how to build businesses. Um, he became famous when... If you remember, Tyco in the early 2000s became a, a big controversy and the, and the CEO went to jail. Well, Ed Breen was the fellow who came in in 2002 and took over Tyco and made it a huge success. And it's through having those kind of patient investors. Because the other, as much as I think, you know, Joe, I think you and I would agree that our strategy is interesting to people. Strategy is only part of the equation. You need to have a company that's well structured and you need to have shareholders that have the same vision that you do. And, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, Michael, you pointed to our stock having a good couple of months. I actually think that if you look at the chart for 2015, it's much more telling because we started on January 31st at about 45 cents a share. And on December 31st, we were 43 cents a share. Now, as CEO, my goal is not to do nothing for a year. But in a year that oil drops 70 percent, it's not a bad accomplishment to hold in. And the only way that you can prove that you have a shareholder basis patient is time. You know, the chart tells the story a year later. And that's why Jericho has not only has, I think, the three key ingredients, the fourth is timing and opportunities like this to buy assets that you can buy day one and make money off of. It's just, it, you're, we're a little bit fortunate to have the timing we do. I don't, you know, I don't like to see misfortune in, in the world. I don't like to hear that companies are going bankrupt. But, you know, my shareholders expect me to take advantage of these situations. And so far, we've been able to. And as much as you may see a spike this year, you might be right. I still think there's going to be a tremendous amount of bankruptcies and, and distress this year. There's going to be quite yeah. a bit of product to choose from. And Alan, let me just summarize how I understood the strategy of the company. Is, um, with your good financial situation, you have no debt. Yeah, you are able to raise money even in, in bad markets, you're going bargain hunting for projects that fit your criteria, that can bring in cash flow to the company within, as you said, I think one to three months, right? Really short period of time. And you're expanding, or you want to, your job right now is to get more and more and more of these type of um, land packages and wells. Um, and then the, the vision for later on is that you, you will pay a dividend to your, as you pointed out, your really long-term and supporting shareholders, you're going to, to pay a dividend. And maybe if oil really goes, as said, Joe said, yeah, back to, to really higher levels, there might be the need of a, a major company to replace their own reserves to buy you in total. Is that kind of, in a nutshell, what, what you said? Yeah, it's, it's very, very good, Michael. You, you understand exactly. Now, a dividend is, is very far in the future because... <laughs> Right now, with the cash that we, if we have, if we are profitable right now, I think it would make more sense to put that profit back into the ground and making acquisitions. But in a normalized market, if there's no M&A activity, the goal would be to get profitable and pay that. I, I think that this company will remain as TSX venture stock for the next, you know, probably definitely this year, but towards sometime in next year, I wouldn't surprise me if we start looking for a U.S. listing because okay. we are really, a, a, as much as I'm Canadian, this is really a U.S story we've right. become extremely focused um the, the there is opportunity out there and i'll point to you know our last you know our most recent acquisition which is not that long ago on december 29th we raised seven million dollars 
um, in a non-brokered finance. At which on, uh, price level? At 40 cents a share. Okay. Okay, we were trading at 41 cents at the time. We did it at market financing. Wow. We, uh, that was on December 29th. On December 30th, I spent the money. <laughs> but we had already, you know, we'd been, we'd been working on a transaction since February. We paid collectively with our partner, and I'll explain the partnership in just a minute. But we paid collectively $13 million for the asset. On the most recent reserve report that was filed on April 30th, so 12 days ago, the auditors and the independent engineer valued that over $20 million. Um, they valued it closer to 28, but I think, you know, I think if you look at it conservatively. But at the end of the day, what does that tell you? Is that you bought, paid something 13 for something that in just a matter of months is worth more. And the key to that transaction was we bought it from a company called Postrock Energy. In 2006, 2007, Postrock traded for $80 a share. On, <coughs> on March 28th, they filed for bankruptcy. And we were able to buy it just before it went to bankruptcy. And I think that's important because as much as we say there's deals out there, our model is to be patiently aggressive and extremely disciplined. So if we price a project, and that goes beyond our price. We don't, as much as we, you know, love the project, we don't chase the price because it's very important to remain disciplined. And what we've seen as they get into chapter 11, sometimes there's a bidding process that builds it up. So buying it before was a really good fortune for us. Yeah. Now we, we are a little bit familiar with chapter 11. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of the um, energy or oil bonds in our portfolio. Yeah. And it was energy XXIE and, uh, Brightburn, Lynn, yeah, they all filed for Chapter 11. Yeah. Um, just, just quickly touching on the acquisition. Um, so you do all your acquisitions um, in cash transactions or is it possible that later on you also do equity transactions? Oh, right. Every transaction to date has been cash only. Um, but in the future, as our market capitalization grows, I would like to use our stock for acquisitions. Okay. There's going to come, and I can use an example right now of one of one asset we really would like. Um, it was doing 1,400 barrels a day. The creditor has taken control of it. It's down to 600 barrels. You know, before I do, you know, if you compare the oil crisis, right, I won't call it a crisis, but the drop in oil prices right now to the 2008 crisis. In 2008, especially in the United States, um, banks foreclosed on houses, you know, left, right, and center. They, they, were, they were just taking the keys and boarding them up and selling them. You haven't seen that kind of default in the oil market, I think, for one reason only. And that is a bank doesn't mind owning a house, but a bank does not want to own an oil well. Oil wells are, have environmental liability. They need to be run. So when a creditor gets them, they, they do want to do something with them. In the case of this particular creditor, the problem with an all cash transaction is when I buy the asset from them, it's a binary event. It ends there. So they lose money. If I can use my stock, I give them a little bit of hope that they can recover some, that they can still participate in the mm -hmm. asset. So let's suppose you have a vendor who owes a million dollars and you're willing to pay $2 million for the asset. If you can give him the million dollars to pay off his creditors, but give him a million dollars in stock, then he still owns part of the oil well. And that's right. important to the vendor. And that might help me close transactions that other people are unable to close. Right. Get it. Yep. Uh, coming back to a little bit to this um, past acquisition, um, so far, uh, what, what was this, your drill inventory there? Is there a drill inventory there first? Second is what cost uh, normally uh, drills there, uh, included the completion. Um, and what <coughs> you can expect per well, uh, what, how much you produce. And for more uh, important is what is the decline curve on, on some, some wells? Sure. I'll start with your last question first, and that's the decline. The horizontals, we, when, a, when you drill a horizontal well, the decline is, is steep and radical. So everything we buy is produced for two years. So we expect the decline rates to be around 8% and the wells to last, you know, 10, 8 to 15 years. horizontal wells or, or conventional? Yep. Horizontal horizontal and conventional. So okay. everything we've purchased has already had the immediate decline. Um, the verticals don't decline as much and they're very conventional reservoirs. That's one of the problems you had with the Bakken was when they were measuring the Bakken and when the engineers, you got to remember, they had never, they had no history of production. No one really knew how much you were going to recover and no one really knows what the declines are. It's still a question today. But when you go to Oklahoma, where the first oil wells were drilled in the 1900s, there's a ton of historical data. So you know exactly how the decline curve is going to look. 
because they're all very, very similar. So we are in conventional fields with a few unconventional wells, but the decline will remain the same. With respect to drill inventory, this is what I think the market doesn't always realize, and maybe, you know, yeah, I think your question is astute because it's a good question. I'll use the Chaparral Energy acquisition as the perfect example. We paid $1.5 million. I went to Oklahoma City, we walked into Chaparral Energy, big company, and when you buy the project, not only do you get the infrastructure that's on the field, so that when they, when they invested $40 million, they expected this thing to produce you know, massive amounts of oil. So your tanks, your roads, your pumps, all these things are almost oversized. And where you really need a, a Volkswagen, you're driving a, you know, you're getting a Ferrari field. But more importantly, when you walked in there, we took away all of the, they gave us oh, on the first acquisition, probably 40 bankers boxes, you know, these boxes where you keep files. All in there is all the, all the future drilling is already engineered for us. It's all laid out for us. They've done all the seismic, they've done everything they need. So we sit with that information in our inventory now. The post rock acquisition, I had to rent two full offices down in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just for the boxes of information. So we're still going through them all, but we have this huge advantage of drill information and the drilling targets already laid out by major companies. And as much as post rock engine, post rock went bankrupt and Chaparral recently missed an interest payment. Um, so they could be on the verge of bankruptcy. These are not dumb people. These are really good companies that are just on the wrong side of the trade. You know, they, their, their, their capital structure with their debt structure has put them in a precarious position. They still know what they're doing. It's just that they can't get ahead of that curve. And we are that we get the benefit of that when we buy these projects. Um, one of the projects we bought, which is the, uh, was on the, around December, it was one of the, we acquired two assets on December 30th. This asset was doing about 100 barrels a day. And Audrey McClellan's company um, in 2014 tried to buy the project for $80 million. And they were buying it for the, what we think is the Woodford Shale, which is some of the potential below where we're producing. We paid $3 million for it. So is it going to be worth 80? Personally, I don't think so. But could it be worth a lot more? Absolutely. Um, and in the meantime, we think we can get this thing, these wells to profitability where not only will they be profitable in the field, we can get the company profitable. So we have a, we have a huge inventory of drilling targets already engineered. Um, and coming to, to um, your yearly cost, what you must invest uh, to, on, on CapEx to hold the, the, um, the production stable? Well. That's a good question. And the acquisitions are just too new to give you a, an honest answer for that. Um, we, what, we, what our re reserve report that only came out 12 days ago will tell you is that this year we won't be doing any drilling on the wells, but what we'll do is we'll work over each of these wells. Mm -hmm. And that should, not only will it hold the land by production, but it should keep the decline at a fairly stable rate. So that's a question as we begin to learn these fields over the year, I'll be able to, to forecast a little bit better. Uh, uh, can you say how many drill holes are at the moment in production in these uh, three fields? Well, I operate 18 horizontal wells mm -hmm. and over 100 vertical wells. Okay. Uh, and what can you say how, how um, uh, the workover cost for, for horizontal and uh, for uh, yeah, the convertible wells? What is We're only for? working on the horizontal right now because the payback is so quick. The nice thing about operating a horizontal well is as much as they're expensive to drill, they're cheap to operate because you're covering, because it's horizontal, let's just say the, horiz the lateral is 2,000 feet. You're covering many, many, many sections. So you hold it with, you hold a lot of land by one well, and truly you only have one worker on the well. So it keeps your operating. So our biggest costs are electricity and labor. So if we can keep those things under control, we can get profitable. The expensive part of a horizontal well would be things like the pump, because the pump is submersible and deep down in the well. So it's expensive to replace. You know, a pump will be thirty to fifty thousand dollars. But if you can increase production by five, ten, fifteen barrels a day, the last two workovers we did, and I did a news release about it about a month ago, the payback was in under sixty days, around sixty to ninety days payback. So you increase your field, you're paid back already, and then you've got the yes to the year to enjoy the profits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I and 
the 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 key too now is that when we started in Kansas, you know, we built a team and they they've done very well. We now are really building a team in Tulsa. And as much as I'm located here in Vancouver, all we do in Vancouver is accounting and regulatory. The majority of my employees are in Tulsa, and I think you're going to see this company become a Tulsa-based company in the future. Um, your team is critically important. And in March, we added, although in the first year we didn't have a petroleum engineer or a geologist on full time, we didn't because we were too small. <coughs> it didn't make sense for our budget. Now that we're getting bigger, we have retained those people. And the nice thing is we've worked with different consultants over the last two years. So we had a lot of, we knew who we wanted to work with. We knew who were good people. And right now in Oklahoma, there is a, you know, they talk about economic recovery in the United States. In Oklahoma, you don't see it. You know, their people want work. And for a small company like ours, that's really good for us because we can get talented people. And we're getting good publicity. Um, that may not mean anything to you, but in Tulsa World, two weeks ago, we were written up in the business section. Now, it's not the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, but locally, that's important because we're one of the few companies actually hiring people and growing. And that's, that's, that really works well for us in that state, gives us a good, you know, a good, um, a good leg up on other companies. Right. Because, sorry, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, one question I'm asking, coming back to, to, to the potential drill holes, what you have for uh, drill inventories. I know exactly you, you said you get a lot of information, but you, can you say a rough number what you can ex or what you expect? How, many, uh, how big is your drill inventory there? What you so far? Well, I, it's definitely over 300 wells right now, but probably over 500. Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. more than we could do in a, in a year. I mean, and we want to, and everything that we target, so. Our goal would be, I'm, never, I'm not going to say we're never going to drill a horizontal well, but I believe horizontal wells are for bigger companies with more capital because a company like ours can't afford a bad horizontal well because yeah. even in these low drilling prices, they're still six or seven million dollars. Right, so um, it's, you know. But, but in your drilling, the drillers are for sure also conventional holes. Uh, that's what I'm saying. The majority, the majority that we look at are conventional. Now, Right when oil was 70, 75, and if you're right and oil goes back to 70, 75, they'll be looking for what they call the next shale play. And the Woodford shale was, was gaining a lot of popularity. And pretty much all of our property has Woodford on it. And the drilling that I talk about is in Mississippi and above. Mm. So it's got deeper potential that maybe a larger company might want um, if that play becomes you know big in the future. But in the interim, I stay focused on what I can produce. Uh, as I'll say, you're, let's just say, you're mistaken and oil doesn't recover this year. As a company, we need to be prepared for lower for longer. So mm -hmm. even though we believe it's 60, maybe it's not six months, maybe it's 18 months. So we look at the conventional wells that can make money at this price environment. And then mm -hmm. we just get, we'll just be surprised to the upside if oil goes up, which I think is good for our shareholders. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and do you have any numbers what, what the conventional hole cost or will be cost? Sure, they're not expensive. They're two to three hundred thousand okay. dollars. Hit the six zones. Okay, but the infrastructure and so all is is all there. It's all in place, and you can use it for for your uh, future or hopefully future growth or future production. Yeah, like the post rock acquisition, we picked up offices in the fields with three tail three trailers with unbelievable monitoring equipment. You know, I can look at my iPhone and I can tell you if my well is down overnight. These are big companies that their infrastructure is much more complete than you would do as a small company and we benefit from that mm -hmm. um, i can send you i don't have a picture to show you online right now but if you look at a picture of one of our horizontal wells what they did was they built pads i walked onto this drill pad and, and you know they clear it off it's quite expensive you have to make it a certain way and i asked the engineer i go why is this so big this seems crazy you could put an apartment building here and it's he said because they were going to drill eight wells there and they've only got one so that'll be benefit for us down the road. Mm -hmm. The other thing that is not really talked about, but is very important, is when you drill horizontal wells, um, one of the byproducts of the horizontal well is water. And you want the oil, so you need to be able to dispose of the water. Every project I've bought right now has massive excess capacity for disposal. And that, in the future, will become a huge operating savings for myself. I have over 30,000 barrels a day of disposal capacity I'm not even using 3,000 or 4,000 barrels a day. So those are wells I won't need to drill. Yeah, 
Uh, coming to the future, okay, you say uh, your goal is to coming up over 1,000 barrels a day, so how do you uh, do this and do you looking more in this area where you are, Oklahoma and Kansas, or are you looking for other areas too? Right now we're pretty much focused in Oklahoma. I'm diligencing six deals right now. You know, we've never been the high bidder on any deal we've gone for, but we've closed every deal we've been the successful bidder. So I suspect we'll bid for five out of five out of the six deals we're looking for. And if we close one or two of them, that gives us a real chance to get above a thousand barrels a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you put the time frame on it? Uh, we're actively doing it right now. You, you'll see us bid for three or four projects this year. And mm -hmm. I think you'll see us announce one in the next month that, that we'll be a successful bidder on. That'll be a smaller okay. one, but they're out there. Because as, as we consolidate our land, um, we now have, there's efficiencies for us to buy land that maybe might, might be adjacent to us that would be more valuable to us than it would be another operator. Because the one in well I can think of example, there's a project we're looking at right now. It's 92 barrels a day from four wells. Um, our operator would literally have to drive, you know, 500 meters and, and operate these wells. So uh, we will bid for that one, and I, I think we have a very good chance of being successful on it. Mm -hmm. And the pricing is very good. It's in line with the slide that we've got up on the on right now. You know, if you can buy, I, you know, I look at the Chaparral acquisition and I'm saying, you know, we bought it for 21,000 per flowing barrel. I, I'm certainly not going to promise that we can do that every time, um, because, you know, it's one metric to measure it by flowing barrel. But what's important is not just the flowing barrel, but the other, the the upside, the drilling, the information, the infrastructure, the disposal. All these things are matter. And, and acreage is still selling for 45,000 in our area. So if we're buying for between 25 and 30,000 a flowing barrel, that's, that's good pricing. And financing, uh, you, you can finance the, this acquisition also through your partnership with this uh, private equity companies? So far we've been very, you know, our existing investors have been fantastic. In our last raise, um, the majority of the investors were existing investors. They've, They've invested at 30, 40, and 50 cents. I mean, they've been tremendously supportive. At some point, as much as, as much as obviously I sound very Canadian or North American, my parents are Scottish, and I believe every penny is a prisoner, and I, I hate debt. At some point in the oil business, you do need to use leverage. So at some point in the future, we will employ leverage. The key is this, is the companies that are failing now borrowed money to drill. And the problem with drilling is it's risky. If you borrow money to buy, ca if you borrow to buy cash flow, I think that's a safer proposition. It's like buying an apartment building that has renters on it. You've got revenue and you can cover it. So in this low interest rate environment with the right partner, uh, that would be one to grow bigger beyond sort of two, three thousand barrels. Uh, you, you know, you're going to need to just raising equity all the time will become inefficient. It'll be too dilutive. Mm. So they'll in the, the smaller acquisitions we'll do through equity, just as we've done. We'll look to use our stock in, in acquisitions down the road at a higher market cap, and we'll also look to the to, to another market to be more efficient, whether it be um, some sort of affordable debt. And the key is affordable. I, I've seen I've seen dozens of term sheets over the last year that because people have looked at us and said, "Okay, you have no debt. This is exactly who we want to loan to." And you see these debt sheets that are 12, 15, 16, 20 percent. And in my view, the debt is toxic because ultimately those lenders are going to own the assets. They're like the Watertons of the, um, of, of the finance world. You know, Waterton has loaned a lot of people yeah. money, and they end up owning the project because mm -hmm. it's too onerous. But there is 6 and 7% money out there, and that's cheaper than, you know, right now the reserve-based lending is still 4.5%, 5%. Um, that's, that's efficient capital for shareholders. The key is not to get in that market when you're too small. You have to be realistic about your size. And, and right now, and it's worth talking about this thousand barrels a day and why I mention it, it's very funny because, or very contrary, is right now when you look at, um, and I don't know if I have the slide, I'll have to check, but if you look at investment funds right now, in fact, I'm going to move to a slide here. I'm going to just slip quickly here. This slide here, um, chart 11, is the lower right-hand corner. This talks about where sort of the ETFs and where the different funds investing in the indexes are. And right now, you've seen a, you've never seen capital flow away from oil faster. All these funds are so underweight energy, which is really contrarian because I would thought you want to buy energy when it's low, not sell when it's low and buy when it's high. But what's going to happen for Jericho 
is if we can get over a thousand barrels a day and we can get in the s p 2000 3000 all these small indexes as the capital flows come back to the energy market that'll benefit the shareholder of jericho greatly because you'll suddenly be the one that everyone's buying because right now all these index funds that hold oil companies most of the oil companies are falling out of the funds because they don't qualify anymore you know they're on their the debt equity ratio is way too high they're on the verge of bankruptcy so there's going to be fewer fewer companies to buy but there's going to be a tremendous the capital will move back into the markets you can see from the early days of this chart if you look to the left in 2006 2007 where the equity flows where we're at today is shocking that there's no majority of funds are underweight energy and i think it's a big mistake at these prices this is when you should be buying energy at these prices you just have to be selective on who you buy i agree just just quickly because we are skipping through some of these slides um i i yeah. trust that the presentation for those that are interested is available for download on the website which is um, www.jerichooil.com and um yeah we we have to wrap it up wrap it up anyway in the next couple of minutes so um yeah. Is there some some more highlights from the presentation that you want to per, point out right now? Um, you know, I, as I told you earlier, I, I don't, I don't, I don't always go slide by slide. Through no, no, the, no, that's the, fine. The presentation, but as and just to confirm, yes, if you go to the homepage of JerichoOil.com, right in the center there, you'll see that um, the new presentation up. This is this presentation's entitled Q2. Okay. The reason I point out that it's entitled Q2 is. I think that junior companies sometimes don't do a good job of keeping their shareholders up to date. I, uh, you know, when you buy share, it's difficult for a company like ours because if you're not drilling, you don't have news every day. You know, you're negotiating transactions and they take three, six months. But it's important that you all keep your shareholders updated. That's why we make sure we're active. You know, we have all the social media feeds and quarterly we do a presentation. Next week, I would encourage your anyone who's watching this, I, I've written a letter to the shareholders. It'll be a three or four page letter that outlines much of what we talked about today. And every, I did one last year, which you can read. Um, and you're going to see this one. And I think it speaks to what we do. So I encourage people to go look for that. Um, we'll do it as a news release as well. But, you know, we talk a lot about our acquisitions in the presentation. We talk about the current environment and the flight of capital. Um, the different basins in the drill rigs, you pointed to that earlier, Joe. If you use that drill rig count, it's been dropping dramatically. It's at record lows. But the, the, the number one that's, that, that's lost the most rigs is the Mississippian. And that's why we went there, because that's where the opportunity is. The, the lower amount of rig counts, the more opportunity for us. Um, this is the rig count right here. This is the actual rig count that I just pointed out. And it talks about the drop in, in wells and it's basically down to zero. Um, you know, just across the ridge, you've still got, you know, it's like prices haven't changed. Um, so you've got to look for your opportunities. This slide I think is also important is if you believe what Joe said and you believe oil moves to $75, you know, you can buy oil right now at 46. And then uh, when oil hits 75, you know, that's what you'll make. You'll make $30 a barrel. When you buy an oil company of ours, we use the Pareto principle, which shows you get exponential growth because we are buying, just to explain the, the chart to anyone who's watching, <coughs> PDB stands for proven, developed, and producing. And a PUD is proven and undeveloped. The PUD category is like in a gold mine, it's like a resource, it's not for sure. Um, and right now in the, in the industry, if you look at our reserve report, we have zero value for PUDs, and we do that to be conservative. But as oil moves up, those lines are going to move, and you're going to bring what's undeveloped into um, into your valuation. Uh, you know, I look at the project we paid thirteen million dollars for. We can actually go historically look because it was a public company, and back in two thousand six, seven, eight, we can tell you what that project was worth when oil was seventy or seventy five. You know, in, that's an incredible tool to have. And it was valued in the $90 million range. So does our project get there again? Even if it only gets half that way, it, it will have been a tremendous buy for our shareholders. So these things are all general. Um, these are all uh, you know, general topics that we use. I have a picture of Warren Buffett here in my presentation. And as I said, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And if oil does recover to 70, 75, uh, we will not be so greedy. Um, you know, we're building a company. 
I think if you build a company with a view of getting profitable, and I, I think sometimes junior companies miss that, that should be your goal. Your presentation shouldn't be, we're buying to get bought out. Good companies just get bought. And if you're focused on profitability and, and getting tremendous assets, you could become attractive, but your worst case is you're making money. And then in the appendix, you'll see that um, the last thing I'll point out, that's our area of study, but I'm going to point out our structure. Okay. Is that Jericho Oil does everything right now with a family office. And that family office, it gives us a tremendous flexibility. For example, we do everything 50 50. Um, the advantage is that scale is important in oil. And if we have 45,000 acres, that means our partner is 45,000 acres. So if an oil company is looking for a package, it's really twice as big. And at the same time for a young company, when we go into a project and we do 50-50, yes, we're giving away low upside, but we're also limiting our risk. And that's also important because when you buy a junior stock, it's not just about making five, 10 times your money. You also want to limit your downside. So you want a management team that's A, very invested in the stock and we're at around 25% ownership. And also, so in that way you treat the, the money that's in the treasury like it's your own. And that's extremely important in building value. And so limiting risk is important. And having a family office partner has just been an incredible advantage that other companies don't have. Okay. I think that's the end of the presentation there. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's on the last slide. Yeah, that's the contact data. Um, I had the pleasure to already talk to Adam Rabiner, right? So he's available on, on uh, sorry, on, on the phone to talk to you. Um, there's um, all the channels for social media. There's the website. And um, yeah, I just urge you to really take a look. Do start doing your own due diligence on the company. I was, again, I was... I, I'm delighted that Alan took the time to talk to us. Yeah, I really liked what I heard, um, and will 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 um, yeah continue to watch the development of the company. And maybe Alan, yeah, if you're available in a couple of weeks or months, um, we should do a follow up. Yeah, of this uh, CEO roster conference. And for now, yeah, that that's it. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time, and um, see you later. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Alan. Ja, kurze Zusammenfassung noch von meiner Seite. Finde ich relativ spannend, was die Company macht. Der Vorteil ist, sie ist halt schuldenfrei. Hat halt das Thema nicht, wo, wo jetzt alle anderen ähm, Companies eigentlich das Problem haben, dass sie eigentlich sehr stark äh, geleveraged sind. Das heißt, sie haben sehr viele Schulden draus und die Schulden drücken die Company jetzt an die Wand. Wir haben das gesehen bei Energy XXI, wir haben das gesehen bei Lün. Möglicherweise sehen wir das jetzt bei Breitland in Kürze. Also die Banken drücken die Companies einfach an die Wand und sie haben auch alle Möglichkeiten dazu, denn äh, sie haben ja Schulden und als Schuldner ist man halt, äh, eben, oder als Gläubiger ist man immer halt im Vorteil gegenüber den Eigentümern. Ähm, sie haben keine Schulden, haben mit einem Family Sea Office äh, sehr gute Partnerschaft, die ihnen Geld zur Verfügung stellen, kaufen jetzt Equities auf, konzentrieren sich vor allem aufs Midcon-Feld in äh, Oklahoma und Kansas. Ähm, bauen dort auch ein Office gerade auf, ähm, also, äh, ja, stellen gerade neue Mitarbeiter ein ähm, und haben mehrere Akquisitionen schon gemacht, produzieren jetzt irgendwo so um den Dreh 500 Barrels. Ähm, für ihnen glaube ich sind es 250 Barrels, weil meistens 50-50 geteilt wird, aber sie äh, sind jetzt gerade dabei in dem Prozess mehrere Angebote zu legen für weitere ähm, Käufe. Erner Ziel ist es, so zu kaufen, die Firma, dass sie in nur kürzester Zeit profitabel ist. Das heißt, das Abpotenzial, also die ganzen drill und so weiter, das ist alles nicht, nichts wert unter Anführungszeichen, sondern das wird alles nur auf die aktuelle Produktion bezogen. Und das ist genau das Abpotenzial, das man hat. Das heißt, sie kaufen jetzt eigentlich Produktion ein, die in Kürze eigentlich oder die eigentlich profitabel ist. Die Companies brauchen die Geld, um um ja, ihre Schuldenthemen zu, zu bedienen und sie kaufen jetzt das mit der aktuellen Produktion ein und das zukünftige, ähm, ja, zukünftige Potenzial, das ganze Drill Inventories und so weiter, die bleiben den Aktionären übrig und das macht es eigentlich relativ spannend. Äh, die Strategie finde ich gut, es ist natürlich nur ein bisschen klein, der Aktienkurs hat sich sehr gut gehalten, aber 
Äh, so wie es das machen, äh, gefällt mir ganz gut. Ich werde auch versuchen, im Juni mit ihm selber ein Meeting zu machen, wenn ich drüben bin und werde äh, dort schauen äh, und mit ihm persönlich reden. Da kriegt man einfach ein bisschen mehr, besseres Feeling und was er auch so tut und da hört man ein bisschen mehr, was sich da abspielt. Ja, also nicht uninteressant, das sollte man sich auf die Watchlist setzen, Jerry Carroll und ja, JCO ist das Kürzel in, in, in Kanada und der TSX Venture. Ja, das war von meiner Seite. Ja, und von meiner Seite noch kurz, äh, ich sollte meine Interviews nur noch mit dem Joe Brunner machen, weil er macht einfach diese perfekten Zusammenfassungen, ja, die sie ja bei mir immer anmahnen, dass ich nach den, englischen, nach den englischen Interviews halt nicht mehr auf Deutsch zusammenfasse. Ja, deswegen danke Joe, ja, das, ich habe da auch nicht allzu viel zu, äh, noch hinzuzufügen. Also ich finde, wie gesagt, die Strategie des äh, Unternehmens wirklich auch sehr gut. Man hatte, muss man natürlich auch sagen, man hatte das Glück, dass man äh, erst relativ spät in den Markt eingestiegen ist, dann äh, durch das, also man hat halt, sag mal, in einem fallenden Markt dann seine Assets kaufen können. Man hatte äh, durch das Team und auch insbesondere durch den Alan Wilson die Möglichkeit, äh, zu sehr guten Konditionen sich ähm, Kapital zu beschaffen. Äh, er hat ja auch zwischendurch gesagt, dass sie eigentlich ähm, A, immer in, in Nähe des aktuellen äh, Börsenkurses finanzieren können. Also beim letzten Mal war die Aktie bei 41, also sie haben bei 40 finanziert. Ähm, normalerweise sind ja immer so doch äh, gewaltige oder größere Abschläge da äh, bei solchen Private Placements. Und sie haben, und das war auch ganz wichtig, sie haben auch keine äh, Provision gezahlt. Das war jetzt kein Brokered Financing, wo noch die Broker noch irgendwie 7% und Warrants und irgendwas kriegen. Also er scheint da wirklich ganz gut vernetzt zu sein. Ja, das in einem schlechten Markt, ja, wo eigentlich sonst keiner, und wir haben es ja leider auch bei Airway und auch bei vielen anderen äh, kleinen Juniors gesehen, ja, die haben es halt einfach an die Wand gefahren ja, und, und konnten auch kein Kapital mehr raisen und äh, ja, da scheint äh, Jericho gut aufgestellt zu sein. Strategie finde ich super, wie gesagt, mich erinnert es immer noch ein bisschen an First Mining, aber auch an andere, die jetzt halt in einem äh, Depressed Market halt, sage ich mal, so ein bisschen Grab räubern, ja, äh, und einfach die Assets aufkaufen, die dann in einem steigenden Markt, die, die jetzt schon profitabel sind nach kurzer Zeit, aber natürlich mit steigenden äh, Rohstoffpreisen, in dem Fall Öl, halt wirklich einen, einen Riesenhebel nach oben bieten. Also ich finde es gut, ähm, er hat aktuell 250, oder er, Jericho hat aktuell 250 äh, Barrel pro Tag Produktion. Er meint, dass es relativ kurzfristig äh, jetzt auch durch Akquisitionen, die jetzt auch anstehen, also man will in diesem Jahr auf jeden Fall noch irgendwas Neues, neue Projekte akquirieren, ähm, dass er die, die, die Produktion auf jeden Fall vervierfachen kann auf 1000 Barrels pro, pro Tag. Und ähm, ja, es gibt also Newsflow, hat er gesagt. Natürlich gibt es nicht permanent jeden Tag Newsflow. Ja, ähm, einfach dadurch, weil so, so, so ein Deal, also wenn man halt eine, eine Company oder ein Projekt übernimmt, das ist natürlich sehr viel, was man im Hintergrund besprechen muss, bis die ganzen Verträge ausgearbeitet sind und ähnliches. Aber wie gesagt, ich finde es gut. Ich habe es auf der Watchlist. Ähm, ich tue mich ja immer schwer, so auf, auf in steigende Aktien reinzukaufen. Ich weiß, das ist falsch, aber das bin halt ich einfach. Ja, also ich würde mir, ich würde mir vielleicht einfach ein Limit setzen, ja, je nachdem, wo die Aktie jetzt heute steht, ich habe heute den Kurs nicht, ähm, nicht auf dem Schirm, aber äh, gucken Sie mal, ob Sie irgendwie mit Glück mal ein Abstauberlimit äh, reinlegen können, äh, es, es, es ist ja keine Eile, ja, ähm, der Ölpreis wird auch noch ein paar Wochen äh, sicherlich nicht auf die, die äh, Höhen gehen, die der Joe da genannt hat, aber ähm, versuchen Sie irgendwie Stücke zu kriegen, ja, wenn Sie diese Story interessiert hat, lesen Sie sich vorher nochmal die Webseite durch, Präsentation durch, follow, folgen Sie dem Unternehmen auf Social Media und wenn Sie antizyklisch sind, also wenn Sie an Öl glauben, wie der Joe und ich auch, ja, mit leichteren Abschlägen, dann ist das sicherlich was, was Sie auf der Watches haben sollten. In diesem Sinne, ich rede wie immer viel zu viel, aber ich komme halt aus Köln, ich darf das und in diesem Sinne, vielen Dank für Ihr Interesse. Tschüss. Thank you.